back to the rest of the group. He's a real character. It's good to see him back. From Ezra to the Gold Coast we travel. We don't fly, drive or take the bus. No, we travel back and forth. We're wet and weary, happy bunch of us. And we're riding from Yalara, across and out back to the coast. And we're riding for the doctor, brings help to the last outpost. Driven by a feeling that comes dreaming with the coast. Takes us on our journey down many outback roads. Clicks behind them and 2,000 more to go. Gordon O'Connell had taken a good lead in the camel race, but he was under constant pressure from Peter Cape of the SAS, who in turn was embroiled in a bitter struggle for second place with Steve French, an outback camel dealer. Steve French on DC. Can you sign that for us, Steve? Steve French had a deal with the SAS guys that he supplied them with the camels and the training. And any prize money that they won would be split half half. Okay. Zodiac Mind Walk. The SAS blamed the camels and they also blamed Steve French for not spending the correct time with the camels. That camel was actually given to us. I said, okay, here's your camel, bang, bang, bang. I didn't know what I was doing, put it that way. Now the guy that supplied the camels to them is putting the pressure on them to beat them, you know, so it makes it even more interesting. We've got blokes who've been riding all over each other's shoulders day in, day out for six weeks. It, it becomes a personal thing that I'm going to beat that bloke and the other bloke says, I'm not going to let him beat me. Sooner or later, the pressure's going to get to him. Our storyteller, Paddy McHugh, was having a rough time. He was running about halfway through the field of 42. I never expected the race to be so tightly fought as it is now. But it's becoming quite a difficult process just to catch up to the buggers. After being bogged down for four days in the rain and mud of the Channel Country, the race was finally on its way again. The second leg had been abandoned and the camels were making their way into Bullia for the start of the third leg. 
But there were other problems besides the mud. Many people began to feel the effects of a mystery illness. They didn't just get it once and get over it and that was it. They got it, and they got it again, and they got it again. We had uh, one of the SAS blokes who was losing something like 10 or 12 kilos in weight in three or four days and still out there leading his camel. We had Gordon going into renal failure, exactly the same. Got on his camel and went when he was totally dehydrated. I mean, the bloke was nearly dead on his feet. Nothing seemed to be able to stop the unsinkable 68-year-old swaggy Drew Kettle. He was determined to walk all the way. Just hope I can get enough rum into me tonight to throw it off. That's how it is. We hope we can keep going, that's all I can say. I'm sure that we will. We apparently picked up the disease in an area where it was endemic, in other words, quite common. We were all under stress. We probably weren't eating as well as normal. Our hygiene levels obviously dropped as the race went on through the Simpson because we were inundated with flies, dust, dirt, sand. People were doing these long days, coming in, probably not eating much, just sort of grabbing a few hours sleep, going again. Both backup crews and riders pushing themselves to the limit. Their immune system was down and they were susceptible. We all caught it somewhere. It was a mean and nasty to all the crew. For want of something better, let's call it the camel flu. Oh, just throwing up and diarrhoea and stuff like that. And you feel really just weak and drained sort of thing. We've had um, seven people taken to hospital. One of our leading riders has been in hospital for four days. We need him to recover. All up, I'd say out of the 18 people, about 14 have been affected in uh, varying degrees. It has been diagnosed as Shigella, which is a form of dysentery. My wife Virginia got Shigella and my little girl Annabella got it as well. Little motel room, eh? They spent five days in hospital. Whenever we went in to see them we had to wash our hands and it was quite a contagious type of disease. Much better today. Yeah, better. Yeah. And my main concern is really the, uh, the disease situation that is building up amongst us. Gordon O'Connell was taken to uh, Mount Isa, um, Mount Isa Hospital. He chose not to truck the camel out even as ill as he was. He pushed himself to the limit and actually got to a stage where he endangered his life. He hadn't uh, passed urine for about four or five days. Uh, high temperatures and you just sort of waste away. Everybody obviously exposed to people who have got symptoms. I'll get you to go to the table on the right over here and we'll give you the antibody to try and prevent you from getting it. I even told the doctor if I was not let out on time, I would leave on time, no matter what. They've sort of quarantined us for five days until we're sure the disease is all completely under control. They're afraid if we leave early that we'll spread it through towns like the plague all over the outback and it, it will, it'll just get out of hand. I think the final quote was 107 cases treated out of 156 odd people. If it hadn't been contained at Bullyard, it was quite possible to stop the race. It's the first town we've had since we've started the race where the town's actually put on a bit of a party for us. So the, the festivities and the, the Iron Man competitions and the egg throwing competitions and the beer drinking and Whatever else was going on this weekend was fantastic. Everybody was pretty well dehydrated, so it was a bit of a rush to town to sort of replenish our fluid supplies. Famous for this Mimin light. Everybody out here seems to think they've seen one. 
It keeps bringing the people back here and keeps a lot of stories going around the pubs at night time, that's for sure. Now I'm in the front of the car before we drive. And I read my book. So anyway, my newly, my, my newly woman, eh, she looked up the hill and she seen this light. And it seemed like it was just, just floating like, just, and they looked exactly like a bloke with a torch. And as you walk along, it's just going like this, see? But it's a really eerie sight. And when panic sets in, hey, you just bolt, you know? That's what happened to me. I just bolted. <laughs> yeah, I've seen them repeatedly. G'day. Do any of you guys know the way to bully <laughs> For the last month now, we've been wrestling with this mongrel camel Calcadoon. It seems like he's starting to settle down a bit now, and Paul's starting to get the hang of what's got to happen. So now, instead of wasting an hour or more a day, we might be able to pick our pace up and get into the race is what we should be doing. Hey, Paul, you're getting better at that. <laughs> and then we're away for a way. Sure. That little ritual for the day's over. I, you guys getting bored? You can get adrenaline rushes here? <laughs> yeah. I'd oh, sell it. From Bulia, the race is on again. 2,000 kilometres to go along dead straight roads through country as flat as last night's beer. There are four stages in front, each with increasing prize money and an overall prize for the camel who gets to the coast in the shortest time. I'm thinking of the ocean And I'm dreaming of the time When I hold you in my arms again Desert far behind Slip under the cross, my love And I dream that I'm with you Yeah, I'm with you, lady All the way through Time, I think the reason the tension would be a little bit higher is because you've just travelled all day and you're travelling all night while you're getting very tired. And two or three o'clock in the morning, you've just done 20 hours of riding with probably a half an hour, an hour's break. You tend to get a little bit agitated and tempers seem to flare quite easily. What's it like out there at night? Well, with these dark nights, bad. Really, really bad. What do you dread most? Glass. A piece of sharp glass sticking in their foot. No problems with the camel? No. Uh, she's a little, I'm, I'm a little wary of it, hind legs. Yeah? What's the problem? Uh, or... Well, no, not, not so much the pad. They, um, Alex said it was just gravity, but it's worrying me anyway. Gravity? No, fluid. Yeah. Fluid from gravity stamping on the ground sort of thing. Yeah. Gordon, who's the race leader, and Peter Cape, who's hot on his tail, got a bit lost in a big sheep paddock. Because Gordon was such a strong leader, they followed him and they followed him around in this big 22,000 acre paddock. There are accusations of people changing signs. If it's going to happen, this is the place that will happen here. You guys have turned off at 90 degrees, 400 yards out of the bloody homestead and disappeared out of the Never Never and taken the whole camel race with you. All right, at night, trying to find gates and shit like that, no directions, it happened to everyone. There's blokes still back there who've been rooted around. Now, I was told this morning, I was given instructions, sure. I was told also there was going to be directions, which there weren't. OK, sure, we did the wrong thing, but also I believe there's a lot of other wrongs that have been done on your side too. You turned off the road into the middle of a bloody paddock where there's no road at all, led the whole bloody camel race out of a 22,000 acre bloody paddock. I've talked to backup crews, everybody. They've said they all heard the instructions. The light of day, it's great to see it, 
7 o'clock in the morning, it is different, believe me. Do you know I've lost bloody hours and hours on this race because wondering whether I'm on the right track. 25 k's in the bloody bush before I even see a sign. I've never bitched about it. And you're telling us we are wrong all the time now, eh? I'm just well, I'm about sick of it. I'm talking about you. I'm bloody absolutely fed up and sick of it. The bloody hours I've lost is incredible. And I've never said boo. Kept me tongue. So don't bloody lay it on me. The clock's still going right now, okay? There's a lot of pressure on Alex at the moment, the vet. Tracks down there, I've got to go down there with a flashing light and guide you the whole way. Because the race director has been taken off to hospital, he's had quite a few little problems. So Alex has got to wear all the, the good and bad of the race, and I think it might be taking its toll on him a little bit. Well, that's absolute bullshit. Well, that's wear it however you like. The farmer thinks we're the biggest pack of fools he's ever seen in his bloody life. Well, that's the bloody gate open. We're now in the sheep country, Winton. It was here that the Australian Labor Party was born in a shearer's strike, and they wrote a song about a jolly swagman. If you're out of work, well, you carried, you toted your swag. If you could get work, you got it. And if you couldn't, the community looked after you. <coughs> it's very good, you taste some. But it hasn't got gum leaves in it. It could be better. Travelling along beneath the Southern Cross. Warm memories keep off the morning frost. Straight road to nowhere. Camel understands to be a wanderer across the endless land. That's what I like, you a bit of chocolate. Sit, Jennifer is a no, professional fit right for a geriatric ward in the hospital at Caboolture and she yet got Four months off to ride a camel in this great camel race. You've been bower birding again. Yeah, now I picked up that registration plate, it's a long term motorbike. And after about three weeks, the camel broke down. Mm -hmm. And blimey, if she doesn't finish up cooking for an old geriatric. <laughs> again, so I can't get away from them. How's that, eh? <laughs> no doubt about it. <laughs> this is my little bower bird's assortment of tricks that he picks up along the way. We have an emu's backside. We have a pig's head, we have a, and an emu's foot. <laughs> They're wonderful. And in the back of the truck, we have an assortment of dead birds, nuts, bolts, screws, number plate. But there... <laughs> so that's why I don't know what he's going to do with them when he gets home. Where does but, he get them all from? Well, he picks them up on the side of the road. And when he picked up the pig's head, he was walking with it like a swag over the back of his shoulder. And Drew's waltzing his Matilda. He's a swaggy. And he's collecting for that doctor on his way. He's only 68 years young. His dog's named Laddie. And he's walking in that human race today. It's no secret that there's a lot of animosity between Peter Kate, the SAS guy who's running second at the moment, and Steve French, the guy who's coming third. It might be because Steve French supplied them with camels. And out of the five SAS guys that started, Peter Cape is the only one that still remains in the race. There was nothing wrong with the blokes themselves. They were all fit, fit as they could be, but uh, the camels systematically broke down. I'm still here, it's taken them up until now to do everything in their powers to try and make it so that I'm not here and um, it's now beyond a joke in the sense of someone, unless something's done shortly, will get hurt. We heard that there was a, a bit of a punch up between the sass and Steve French. This film I filmed outside the hospital, probably about 50 minutes after we reckon it, uh, reckon it happened, just before we took Steve in to be um, yeah, to be treated. Peter Cape from the SAS pulled me up the camel and proceeded to go. 
Yeah, and who, um, who was standing around at the time? Uh, Bruce, who was running with him, and Gordon did come back, but didn't offer the help or anything. Right, so he came back after and sort of started, but yeah. didn't, uh, didn't say anything. And then you sort of, you, you caught your camel and then pursued it on? No, the camel ran back down the road, so after I got up, I started going back to that. Yeah, and that was where John from Kentucky's yeah. team caught, caught up with you, but he didn't actually see it happen from what I could get. No, not. When I saw him, I, I knew straight away what had happened. You know, that uh, you didn't have to be Einstein to work it out. You know. Well, we're not involved, so yeah. I spoke to my man, he wasn't there, he was with Gordon. Yeah. So um, I've got no real comment to make. So who did it then? Not for me, I don't know. Yeah. For a fellow like that who's trained psychologically to cope with that pressure, to have cracked under those circumstances seems a bit odd to me, you know. Maybe that just shows you how, how much pressure the whole race was under at that stage. Peter Cape was charged with assault by the police and will have to face the music after the race is finished. It's really good to see people are turning out more to see us when we come into a town now. It seems to be doing Drew the World a good race, raised something like $15,000 or more, and we expect it to get better as time goes on. Now we all know that feet are made for walking, but not a hundred k's a day without no shoes. So they made new desert boots and camel sneakers. But the camels had the worn-out sore feet blues. I think it's probably the first time that Aaron Williams have ever had to make a, an elastic side pair of boots for a camel. Steve French is making some shoes up. Gordon seems to have come across a museum that'll make him a pair of boots. Actually, there must be a few people doing this now, isn't there? And at the showgrounds, I'd say everyone's trying to get something that works. You use uh, kangaroo hide, is it? Yeah, I've been told for its weight, it's probably the strongest leather, and I wanted something pretty supple. And the SAS guys are copying the same sort that Steve French is making. The sole seems to be regenerating. There's no trouble with the stitching underneath at all? No, no, it no, 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 no dramas there at all. Well, I've got to the point now where I've got no option at all to put something on the feet. I walked her actually all night because uh, you know, the danger of going off the bitumen was so great um, with the glass and that, that I just walked her, got up and led her all night. Come on, look up. The last time I saw you, Paul, you'd been bucked off, you were demoralised, Calcadoon had run away. Yeah. You were him back to a bully. Yeah. What's happened since then? Just walked around and talked to him, touched him and all that. All that. I tied him down. Then went on and off 150 times every day. He started talking. He never said a word before. But now he's a complaining. Come on. Walk up. Walk up. Come on. Like, it's a question oh, of being on. a boss, I think, with camels. Walk up. Walk up. Walk up, come on. Walk up. Walk up. Come on, walk up. Walk up. But all of a sudden he kind of accepted me in a way. Good and how did that make you feel? Oh, great. I must call out our leg winner, Gordon O'Connell. Gordon has won all four legs of the race so far. Peter Cape from the SAS has come second. Good on you, Jill. And for the first time to break the triangle, Jill Corwell has come third. Oh, Annabella had chicken pox, salmonella poisoning, shigella, one other little disease and a few teeth and all that thrown in at the same time. It was pretty hard on Virginia and, and Annabella too, you know, just being able to hack the pace, I think. We've got today 
straight through. I think we should be there by the morning sometime, early morning. Seven, eight o'clock tomorrow morning, probably. You're finding it tough to do all in one go, are you? Going all night it is, yeah. I think night time's for sleeping. <laughs> The camels themselves are doing really well. It's only the human beings really that are the problem now and the fact that you've just got to keep going. It gets very hard to get up off the ground every day. We've been doing it for over two months. Now and you get up every morning, it's freezing cold and you've got to do the same thing over and over again. Steve French, Steve Moxham and Jill Corwell. I don't think I can get a first place on this leg, but I'm sure with the correct effort and a bit of hard push, I can come third. What's up, Paddy? Can't get him going. Once I um, get on him at the moment, he keeps sitting down on me, because he's never run by himself, you see. And I was hoping I'd bugger I'd catch up with Steve Moxham and them guys, and then I'd be laughing. See, in actual fact, I'm only half an hour behind him, really. I need another kennel to... Just give me a bit of a catapult along. I was powering, you know. I thought I was going to get him. And Jill made the big burst. I think she's a bit of a wake-up to our tactics, you see. <laughs> if we leave a half an hour behind, we catch that up. Then you just tag the leader, all then you're a half an hour in front. And that's how we've been doing so well. You know, I've always had Calcadoon or Wayne or somebody to push with. Uh, Calcadoon, what's happened to him? He ran in the dam back there. Paul said to take the saddle off and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> For a dull moment, I'll gulk it in. These bloody trucks are starting to become a real pain in the bum now. Roger's riding with me and I'll use you, him as my little bit of a push for the day. See you, Roger. to us because we have to travel on the edges of the road. Sometimes they don't get off the road enough for us and sometimes we can't get off the road. I reckon if we're not careful somebody might get killed before the end of this race with the way things are going. Goes out of town or something like that. Five to ten k's come back out and meet us, so we know which way to go into the showgrounds, so we don't get lost and do stupid things towards the end. As long as we're ten k's in front of Frenchie, who cares? <laughs> I don't know whether we're teaching Roger competition. How's your bum, Roger? <laughs> he might be learning the hard way. We did 180 kilometres without shutting down. We started at seven in the morning, rode all day, rode all night, with absolute minimal breaks. Running now, obviously. Third, still. Only by 10 minutes, though. <laughs> Makes life a little bit interesting, doesn't it? Makes the story or the plot thicken. God almighty. My bum is so sore tonight, too. The backup crews have got to do the same, too, because they've got to be there to service us. Uh -huh. 
The temp is fry there, they're awake all night as well. Why did you slow down? Because we thought we had an hour on him. I was told we had 10 kilometres on him. And I thought, no worries, we're over an hour in front of him. Mm -hmm. I don't, I, don't. <laughs> I wouldn't like to be back up myself. They could have packed it all up, make sure everything's stowed, get in the truck, run 10 k's down the road, jump out, light a fire, have a cup of tea ready for us because we just ride in, drink the tea and go. And then they've got to pack that up, jump in the truck and go whatever we think, another 20, 30 k's down the road, have lunch ready waiting for us. There's something about Billy T. Strong. Yeah, <laughs> strong. strong. More water. Cedric's very good, you know, nothing worries him. Everything's just packed up, put away, and he's quite happy. If I say today I want to go 10Ks, 2Ks, 3Ks, 5Ks, that's what he'll do. She comes back really flat instead of coming up more like a greyhound bill like the rest of the camels. And she's running quite a lot of milk here. You can see how large the mammary gland is. It's uh, running a fair bit of milk and how rounded the uh, it was. I don't know, she might be nine months pregnant. She could be, uh, she could be imminent. It's pretty hard to tell. Do you think she should still be racing? Well, Tim's taking her uh, pretty easy. She's not really doing anything that she wouldn't do in the wild. And uh, frankly, I think she's probably coping with the race better than you are. Oh, that's not fair. <laughs> we had two pregnancies on this race. The vet's wife, Patty, who was eight months pregnant. And after a while, we discovered one of the camels was pregnant. So the race was on to see who was going to give birth first. The camel one. The new mascot for the race has been born. We've got a little bit of a saying that there's never a dull moment in the camel business. And I think that saying has been brought to life every day on this race. You've never seen a prouder family than the Patchy Waller boys after the birth of that camel. Now they're going to cheat, they're going to put the baby in the trailer, drive it up the road, because every three hours the camel's got to be fed. The mother will run like the wind to catch up with the baby. They probably even might win the race now. The last thing we expected at the moment was rain like this. We've had enough of the bloody stuff as it was back at Glen Ormiston. It is cold at the moment. We've got oil skins and coats and jumpers and God knows what else on but the rain and that still seems to get through everything. All this has brought a bit of a new meaning to the word uh, ships of the desert. Enough barbed wire fencing me time. G'day, girls. I can't interrupt a game of golf, can I? Yes, but I had a special reason for coming over to see you girls. 45 years ago, I was here during the war, and uh, I had a girlfriend here. I was in the to come back from New Guinea, and I can't, you know, I can't remember her name. So now, if you look at my age, she'd be older than any of you girls. And she was on a dairy farm. I'm sure she'd still be around. Oh, I bet she would be. She yeah. might want to see you, though. No, well, that's very true. <laughs> don't, don't make me Billy too heavy, girls. <laughs> I generally carry a little bottle of rum as my snake bite cure. Oh, You've got to it? take it before you bit, so every morning I have a snurf, snurf <laughs> and I'm right for the day. Oh, see you around. Oh, cheerio. Steady up, laddie. He's all excited. Oh, dear, oh, dear. <laughs> Look, Katie and Gordon seem to have formed some little partnership between themselves at the moment. I'm, I'm not too sure whether it's because they've become good friends or whether they're just trying to cover each other so one doesn't make a break. And Frenchie seems to be a little bit on the outer of that too. I 
I think um, Peter Cape's effort, even with all the training that he's got, like for the fitness training and that, for him to stay in there when all his mates had dropped out for various other reasons, he must be pretty psychologically tough upstairs because his camel was the same sort of camel as Gordon's but nowhere near as well trained, nowhere near as well trained. And Peter ran the first thousand kilometres of the race on foot, so if you could say he's done it hard. Gordon, it looks like uh, no one can beat you now. Oh, just too good, eh? <laughs> Gordon's the only guy that was prepared for the race properly. And 46. You're not so worried about having Crenshaw right up behind you now, are eh? you? No, we weren't concerned never about that. Really. Never were. Like, he's got to make up time on Paddy on this leg, and that's why he's pushing so hard. We were just doing our own thing. Yeah. But you looked as though you were trying to keep him uh, from uh, getting past you then. Uh, no, no. He could have passed. Pretty easy. Could have passed if his, yeah. his camel had it in him, but it stuck. <laughs> his camel was rooted. <laughs> They're still hassling us. We still have had threats, but we just ignore them. Yeah. How's the face? Yeah, good. <laughs> nice. I think we're about equal at the moment on this leg for third. You still got to stay in front of him, eh? Yeah, yeah. How's your camel holding up? Oh, it's the same as it was. A few hundred kilometres ago, buggered. I think mentally they've had enough of racing, yeah, definitely. I wouldn't say they're physically burnt out, but mentally they, they just don't want to do it anymore. What stage is the race at now, Chris? Uh, I think it's probably the wet and cold stage at the moment. Uh, we're just packing up, we're going off up to the uh, CWA hall for the night. Uh, a great big wood stove and uh, a warm, clean building to sleep in. Yeah, be good. It's been two months since we slept in the house. Whenever the going gets tough, the people seem to all band together and pick it all up and get the show back on the road again. The night we had the dancing it was excellent, you know, it really did a lot for everybody's morale. Romances done. Oh, there was a few on the race there. Maybe we shouldn't say too much about the romances. There was a few there that kindled and died and made it a little bit of a patent place from time to time. Gordon's two biggest worries at the moment are that he might get hit by traffic. And the other being that if he travels off the road, is that he'll stand on some glass and cut the feet of his camel pretty badly. We're using a rubber tube at the moment, and we get about 30, 40 k's out of it, and then we have to change them. The risk of throwing it all away can be done in a few seconds on the side of the road. So he's running a bit worried, even though he is out in front. Ladies come over and gave us a coffee cup. And I stripped her into a coffee cup. This isn't bad stuff to drink, and much like cow's milk. And uh, I just had a sip myself and asked anybody wanted. And the mother said, What's it like? Is it anything like mother's milk? I said, I don't know. I'm 42 years old. I've got a terrible memory. This morning, Steve French was, was still three minutes in front of me. So I had to try and do something that was a bit different. So I spread a bit of a rumor around that we were having trouble with the feet of the camel and then started an hour after he left. And I used Ben as the pace camel for the day because we started so far an hour behind him, he doesn't have a clue what's going on. But in actual fact, already halfway through the day, we've passed him, we're in front of him on the overall leg here. So now all we have to do is just keep this pace up and we'll eat it in. So 
I'd maybe if you put your gum boots on and take them off the other end. Because I'm over and get the wet feet. Yeah, but you've got a long way to go on wet feet, darling. Really Do you yeah. want a, a dry pair of socks at the oh, other end? At the school. At the school. At the school. Yeah. All right. I knew when I unloaded the truck to get the gum boots off, he wouldn't wear them, but if I hadn't have unloaded the truck, he would have said, where's my gum boots, Jen? So you've got to be like the Boy Scouts and be prepared. So, in the classic. I've had quite a bit of trouble with my camel the past couple of weeks. The Andridge has uh, left front shoulder badly. And so it's been walking him and dragging 1,200 pounds behind me for the last few hundred k's. I've had so many hardships in this race that there's just no way that I could throw it out now. If I have to, to crawl and drag him behind me or throw him on my shoulders or whatever, I'm going to make it to the coast. Ah, it's good. It's worked tight off what we've tried to do, so that's the main thing. I think we got him by about 30 or 40 minutes, didn't we? I wanted to get a place here in one of the legs. I've done that now. That's the main thing. Good. Yeah, well, we finally got in, what, 15 minutes ago? The only chance you had. Yeah, it paid off. Yeah. I'll tell you what, my nerves would go a little... <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I said, caught up. Look at yeah. the hub. Hardest part again, going over the Great Dividing Range to the ocean. The purse of this section being six thousand dollars is well worth it. So people are really going to push. It'll probably be a new brand of people that are doing the push because the people that have won the last sections, their camels are buggered now and they're just hanging in there just to finish the race. Yeah. So Jesse's having a go. Jesse's yeah, having a go. Jesse, you're right out amongst the leaders now. Right? There with them. Yeah. You've been waiting for this. Um, in a way. Be yes. honest. <laughs> We've been together all the way and I don't mind if I drop a place because he runs. That's, that suits me, that's fine. Because it's my camel, I trained the camel, and my son's riding it. So, you know, I'm pleased to see him go. I hope he does well. But you don't like coming out here to the coast? No, you can give me the sand hills and desert any day. <laughs> just got to get used to it, I suppose. Oh, the hill you know, yesterday coming in a bit, bit rough on the, on the old crook ankle, you know, just mm -hmm. up, just stiffen up a bit. Once it warms up, it's OK. That's the boy going. Well. He's all right. I'm not going to ride him today. I'm just walking to get him safe with the others. Too risky riding him on this slippery stuff, you know, slip over. Not in camel territory, is it? No way in the world. <laughs> push the animals as much as 26 hours where it was just too far. They needed to rest like us. And unlike us, they didn't know when it would end. All they knew was that they were being pushed and they were having a bad time. to see two of the younger people of the race pulling away in the last section. It's also good to see Jesse getting away from his mother and running his race by himself. And Jim Bowen holding up the tradition of the army in its best form and doing them proud. I think he's done a really good job. I felt quite proud for the battalion, especially for the camel as well. The camel did all the work. So what about Jesse? What do you think of him? Quite impressive, you mentioned. Very confident 16 year old. What have you learned about people during this race? Just general faith in mankind. That you've got people from all walks of life and everyone's basically the same once you look through the skin. Like Ruffus Guts, for example. It sort of made it plain to me that it's okay to be casual in life, you know, but still go on. 
by no certain terms are they a bunch of hippies here. They're a bunch of good people, really good people. I've discovered feats of endurance within myself that I didn't think I had. Oh, I got a lot of uh, pain and a lot of pleasure. <laughs> We've got to go back. <laughs> She's only just started, but we're not even halfway there yet. <laughs> We've still got 5,000 miles to go. Some of the camels don't mind the hills. Most of them really hate it. They don't mind walking up it so much, but they can't seem to handle walking down the hills. Personal satisfaction and also for the regiment. I mean, they had what it took, but it was just the animals that broke down. But we've done pretty well with what we've got. What about the rest of the blokes that went home? Pretty upset, actually. Hopefully it was a good public relations exercise, yeah. The people generally assume most of the race drama is up in front, but it's not true at all. It's cutthroat in the back. Just because you guys lost in Vietnam doesn't mean that you can lose here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, my camel's so slow that when we were at the Long Reach Hall of Fame, they wanted to put it in there because they thought it was stuck. Yeah. <laughs> well, my camel's so slow that if it wasn't for the Earth's rotation, it wouldn't be moving at all. My camel's so slow, the continental drift gives him a dizzy head. Yeah, well, my camel's so slow, I've had to carry a stick all through the desert to keep the vultures off. <laughs> the last half, when I've been forced to slow down because of the animal's injury, has become the best half of all. You're busting your gut trying to become 13th or 14th, which is ridiculous. I came here to, to discover Australia and Australians, and finally slowing down gave me the time to do that. He's a changed man. I'll never walk fast again. <laughs> this is how he got second place. <laughs> All the way I had to do that. Well, I joined this race because I hated the world, you see. I hated the army, hated the opposition, and I just loved absolutely annihilating them all. A bit like the Mike Tyson of the camera world. Yes, definitely. <laughs> what did you learn from it? To persist. I learnt to persist. <laughs> you can do well in the race with our five camels all finishing. It's very satisfying for me, and maybe I get a lot more out of that than winning the race. Although it would have been nice to win. Of the coast, for sure. Pick up the four big ones. Do you feel like a winner? Sorry? Do you feel like a winner? Oh, I feel like that at the start. <laughs> Yeah. My earth and go 
going for it, mate. When's this bloody hill going to stop? Get that, mate. Come on. You've done well, Jesse. Extra good, really. You and Jim's only a couple of minutes ahead of you. The race isn't over yet. There's another day tomorrow. The fact that the whole group is splitting up and going their own ways again, that's going to be sad. We've got a really good community here now, a good moving community. Everyone's become very close. What it brought us all together You came from far and wide Some just for the romance Some just for the ride some just for the money Or flat out for the price Yeah, we made it all together From the rock to paradise Woo! Woo! There it is! Lucky I'm sober. <laughs> He's beaten 38 Camelton on this, this run today. It's good finishing. Any, any regrets? Yeah, there are regrets, yeah. but uh, <laughs> I'll give it a pin. That's right, that's right. Too few hey, to mention. Peter. Too few to mention. If this arsehole goes down, I go down. Our family has been bonded by our journey. It's a mixed bunch from many different worlds. Fly blown cowboys, the soldiers and the greenies. It's a mateship from which we all must learn. Have we ridden from Yalara across the outback to the coast? Have we ridden for that doctor? Brings help to the last outpost. And the beauty of the Simpson was it all just a dream? For always in our memories will be part of the camel team. Uh, what do you think of him? He's fantastic. <laughs> It's over and I don't think anybody can believe it. It's terrible. Would you do it again? No, I think I'd ride next time. <laughs> he knew that I was tougher. I knew, well, skinnier and tougher. The point is that Gordon said he would give me half of the money. Of the money. <laughs> If I let him win. No, be, let's be and serious. <laughs> this is uh, not necessarily the order in which uh, they finish the race. The delay at the, uh, the main gate uh, was the vet check. 
Connell won the Great Australian Kimmel Race. Second place went to Peter Cape of the SAS in Western Australia. Third place went to Steve French of Western Australia. Well, I'd like to fight Mike Tyson too for a few million dollars any day. <laughs> no problems. <laughs> Look at this. We've made it to the coast. Congratulations. To the riders and crews who made the trek She's dying I raise my glass to that camel May they forever roam me Great out back You love that bloke, eh? Yeah, I like to keep him Arriving at the coast, we think and wonder. Warm memories of campfires, the endless roads, and the camel mates will always be together, along with all those flies and blistered toes. <laughs> 